Dr. Minkoff, I'm so excited to have you on the show. You're so inspirational. And now you're on my podcast, which is even greater. I am excited to be here. So first well, off, thanks. not all my listeners know who you are and what you do. So if you could just fill everybody in on who you are, what you're all about, and what you do, that would be a great place for us to start today. Okay. So I'm a medical doctor. Um, this is my third career in medicine. Uh, I started as a pediatrician. I was an infectious disease specialist. I was an emergency room doctor. And now I have a very large natural medicine clinic in Clearwater, Florida. Uh, I've been doing this for 23 years. Started with my wife originally. She's a nurse. And we really specialize in people with unsolved medical problems. So our, our average patient has seen 13 doctors, um, Lyme, cancer, central nervous system disease, uh, autoimmune disease, things like that. Um, about 20 years ago, I started a nutrition company, uh, which is called Body Health. And we make uh, really very high quality nutritional products. Uh, my hobbies are Ironman. I've done 43 of them. Uh, you're in Coeur d'Alene, so I've done Coeur d'Alene, I think twice, maybe three times, that Ironman. Um, so I'm active. I love what I do, and um, I'm excited to be here and talk to you. I'm excited to have you. Now, fill my listeners in a little bit on this Ironman stuff, and you said you've had three medical careers. How old are you, Dr. Minkoff? 72. And you're still an active, um, engaged athlete at this age. Yeah. I, I mean, the first, I'd scheduled uh, four races for the spring. Of course, they were all canceled. Uh, I'm supposed to do a half Ironman the end of September. Uh, it's still on. And then I'm doing an Ironman in November. And so far, it's still on. So we'll just see what happens. I'm training as if it's going it to, as if it's going to happen. I love um, that. Talk about yeah. inspirational. When people say they are too old to do something, uh, they just need to come and look at your stuff. Yeah, I mean, age is, a, is, is if, you know, I see people every day who say, well, I'm 60 now and I should retire and I'm old and I can't do it. And really, I think at 60, you should be smarter than you were when you were 40. You know more. You're probably financially better off than you were. You can make a bigger impact. Uh, you can help more people. And so I just don't see that anything other than what I'm doing would be very much fun. And, and so I just, I, I love this. My, my uh, office manager has been with me for eight, 18 years. And a couple of years ago, she's probably just 50. So a couple of years ago, she said to me, like, I'm not retiring till I'm at least 65. And that means you're not retiring either. So um, that's good with, that's good for me. And you're helping so many people. So that's got to be yeah. another, I mean, you can't go anywhere yet because I think you have unfinished business now, right? I definitely do. Definitely <laughs> do. So I so appreciate that. So what got you moving kind of out of a more traditional medical career into more of what you do now, where you're a little, taking a little bit more of a holistic, I guess, approach to things? Yeah, well, I was I was working in the emergency room. It was a chest pain center. It was and it's one of the top hundred hospitals in the United States, and we would see you know people with heart attacks and strokes and broken legs and gunshot wounds. It's pretty much all purpose uh, community hospital emergency room. And my wife is a nurse, and she's also a triathlete, and she was very interested in health. Like before, I was I was in, interested in health from a performance standpoint for myself. But in terms of a sort of as a career or anything like that, I, I, it was, I wasn't interested or I didn't know about it. So one of the first things that she did was she started reading about mercury. And mercury is put into the silver fillings in people's teeth. So when they make an amount, it's called an amalgam because an amalgam is a group of metals that are all bonded together. So a standard amalgam filling, which is, it's about 50% mercury, which is liquid. You know, we probably all... You know, everybody's probably played with mercury or seen mercury in a thermometer. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's 50% mercury. And then if you add copper, tin, silver, you get an amalgam and they put that in teeth. Mercury at room temperature is liquid. It boils at about 110 degrees. So if you heat it up, if you have a hot cup of coffee or soup or tea, which might be 140 or 150 degrees, when it hits that mercury, some of that mercury is going to boil 
it's going to come off. You're going to swallow it, you're going to inhale it, and it's going to come into your body. And there's lots of experiments with sheep where they put fillings in and, and then they would put a label on the, on the mercury so they could track where it went in the body. And then they'd just have the sheep do its normal life. And in a couple months, they would then sacrifice the sheep and look to see where did the mercury go. And they would find it in the brain and in the kidney and the adrenal glands and the lung and the heart. It goes places. So anyway, she learned about this and she decided that she should get the mercury taken out of her teeth. Now, there is a safe way to do this. But this is back in like 1995, 1996. There were very few dentists who knew about it. And the dentist that she went to didn't know about it. And he took his high-speed drill and he drilled out 14 mercury fillings. And within about six or eight weeks, she started to become ill. Her thyroid started to hurt. And then her liver started to hurt. And then, so I, I was in the emergency room. I knew all the good doctors. I had them uh, see her. And what they decided was that she had some kind of an autoimmune condition where her immune system was actually attacking her and it was attacking her thyroid. It's a common condition called uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis and her liver enzymes were inflamed and they tested her for viruses and ultrasounds and all this stuff and they didn't, they, they didn't find anything. So um, then after that, one morning she wakes up and she has weakness of her arm. She's having trouble brushing her teeth and she has weakness of her glute muscle on the same side. And so she saw a neurologist and they thought, well, maybe this condition is MS or something like that. Uh, and they wanted to put her on very strong toxic medicines like prednisone, it's a steroid and interferon. And at that point, we were both like, we got to find a better answer to this. So we started looking around and then she's a nurse and her, she has a business which uh, sends people uh, home health care. So they send people to people's houses to dressing changes and baths and help them take the medicine. And her office was, the, the office next to it was vacant. And so a dentist moved in there. And on the marquee, it said natural dentistry. And one day I was driving to pick her up. He was walking out of his office. And, he, and I stopped him and introduced myself. And I said, what's natural dentistry? And he said, well, most dentists have the idea or the belief or an education that your mouth isn't really part of your body, that it's a separate thing, and that you could do things in the mouth that you would never do in the rest of the body. Like you'd never put mercury in someone's arm. They don't even put mercury on a wound now. The old medicine mercuricum is pretty much banned. There used to be mercury in, in contact lens solution, but it's toxic. And so a regular doctor would never utilize that kind of material. So he said, that's how we think. So we're trying to do things in the mouth that are complementary to the body, not harmful to the body. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, that makes sense. So I said, listen to the story. And I told him the story about my wife. And without a hesitation, he said, she's mercury toxic. But there's nobody in this town that's going to help you. There is a doctor in Seattle. He does training courses for doctors. You should go there. You should learn about this. And then come back and see if what I'm saying is true. So I did that. I went to Seattle. I spent a bunch of time with him. I learned his methodology and I came back and I tested her and she was mercury toxic. And so he had a protocol to detoxify people. I did that protocol and within four or five months, she was fine. Her liver was fine. Her thyroid was fine. All of her weakness went away. So we had friends who were sort of watching this whole thing go on and they came up to me and said, well, I have rheumatoid arthritis or I've got chronic migraine headaches, or I've got ulcerative colitis, can you help me? And at the time I wasn't very confident about what I knew, like I'd had a case success of one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, so I'm in the emergency room, it's shift work. You know, it's like seven in the morning or seven at night or seven at night, seven in the morning, three or four days a week. And I had some off days and, I just, and in her nursing office, she had an extra room. So I said, okay, I'm gonna set up shop there. You guys come in. I wasn't charging anybody at the beginning because I wasn't sure I knew what I was doing. And we'll just experiment. And the thing, it just blew up, just like blew up. And within about nine months, we had a, we rented another space in that same building, 3,000 square feet, and set it up. Within a year and a half, we moved into another building that was 10,000 square feet. So the thing just mushroomed. And as, as I got better at it, I left the emergency room. And I, she and I went all over the country learning from various doctors 
who had kind of non-traditional approaches to helping people who had injuries or illnesses that regular doctors weren't being very successful for. And so that's kind of what we've ended up with now. That's awesome. I love it. And it, it and, and that kind of morphed into your, your uh, supplement business as well now. Um, yeah, because, yeah, because originally in 2000, there weren't very many products to detoxify mercury safely. When we first started, we were doing an IV solution. It's a medicine called DMSA or DMPS, but the stuff is toxic and patients would get an IV of this stuff. And at the end of the treatment, they'd be holding their back because their kidneys were affected by the toxicity of the medicine. So I found a nutritional biochemist and, and we worked together to develop a product that would safely remove heavy metals from the body. It's called Metal Free. And we've been selling it for 20 years. And I used it first in the practice. And then other doctors heard about it. And we, so we started this company called Body Health. And now we sell it to doctors all over the world. And it's really a good product. It's very safe. And it can detoxify the heavy metals from someone uh, without them getting sick. That's awesome. So yeah, I read your book and yeah. I really appreciated what you had to say about amino acids. Okay. And yep. if my listeners don't know, the, the name of your book is The Search for the Perfect Protein. It's available on Amazon and all sorts of other places. And I really loved how you broke down amino acid profiles in this book because protein is protein is protein is not really the case. And a lot of people think like we have lots of people of different um, nutritional beliefs, such as being vegan or keto or who knows what, they all think that a gram of protein is just a gram of protein. And right your book kind of breaks that down. So today I'm hoping that we can expand on that a little bit. Absolutely. Um, this is not taught in, in dietary science. It is not taught in nutritional science. And uh, I never learned it before. I sort of ran into it by accident. Uh, the background story is that I, I was training for an Ironman and I pulled my hamstring and for probably almost a year, I could not get it to be stably healed. And I try, I had access to everything, chiropractic, acupuncture, various kinds of injections, massage, you name it. I tried it and I could not get it to heal. And I bumped into someone who had an amino acid mixture and he said, why don't you try these? He got them over in Europe and I tried it and my hamstring within about six weeks healed. I could go to the track, I could do hard workouts. And a few months later, I went to Ironman Canada. I had my best, my best time ever. And I, so I got interested in amino acids and healing. And I started to measure levels, blood levels of amino acids. This is a standard test. LabCorp does it. McQuest does it. It's an amino acid profile or amino acid panel. Now, an amino acid, if, if someone thinks of language, it's like English is made up of 26 letters. And if you put the letters together in different combinations, you get different uh, words. So from 26 letters, you, the English language has, I don't know, 350,000 words, something like that. Okay. Now in protein chemistry, the alphabet is called, are made up of amino acids. There's 22 of them. And if you put those together in different combinations, you get different proteins. So some are very simple. Like in, in the language, there's a couple of words that have only one letter, like A or I. And in proteins, there's, there's, there's a protein, which is the thyroid hormone itself, is made out of one amino acid, tyrosine and it's got either three or four iodines on it. And it's technically a very simple protein, but it's the simplest use of an amino acid. Glutathione is an antioxidant, it's got three amino acids. Insulin is a protein, it's got, I think, 89 amino acids. So these things are organized by amino acids into longer chains. Skeletal muscle, actin, which is one of the parts of skeletal muscle, has about 5,600 amino acids per chain. So that's really complicated, okay? 
Now, when we eat something, so let's say a person has a steak or a piece of chicken or a piece of cheese or some soybeans, that protein cannot be absorbed into our body unless it's broken down into the individual amino acids. Because if a muscle fiber with 5,600 amino acids, if you chew it up down to one fiber size, and then it goes into your small intestine, it will not be accepted by the small intestine cells because that fiber is too big. It's 5,600 amino acids. And during the process of digestion, those amino acids get separated. So it's individual amino acids. And they can then be absorbed as individual amino acids. They go into the bloodstream, they go to the cell. Now, when that cell has to make a protein, whether it's enzyme or collagen or hair or a neurotransmitter or, or you know, a muscle, the cell has to take the amino acids that it's given and reassemble them into the protein that it's trying to make. Now, in this alphabet, the vowels, so to speak, are called essential amino acids, like you can't. Uh, make proteins without, there's eight of them, eight essential amino acids. Some proteins have good amounts of, 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 the, of enough essential amino acids so that they convert really well. And most proteins don't. So here's another analogy. You have a car factory. You want to make cars. And you have a lot where the, all the raw material comes. And they deliver, and let's say a car, basics for a car, is a chassis, a steering wheel, a motor, and four wheels. So if I deliver, and you're the manufacturer, if I deliver to your lot a hundred wheels, a hundred steering wheels, a hundred motors, and a hundred chassis, let's say let's I deliver one chassis, let's make it easy. One chassis. Mm -hmm. How many cars can you make? Well, you can only make one car. And now you're going to have a whole lot full of 99 steering wheels, 99 motors, you know, uh, 96 wheels. Because you can't use them because you need another chassis in order to put the thing together. Mm -hmm. So when the cell comes along and it needs amino acids, it can only use what it's given. Now, if you take whey protein, which is a very popular protein, and you say, okay, I'm going to measure how much of the whey protein that I ate actually gets incorporated into the protein structure of my body. And if you measure it, there's an easy, there's a fairly easy way to measure this. Only about 16% of the pro of the amino acids that are in the whey protein get made into body protein. The rest of it gets turned into calories with waste and the waste is nitrogen mm -hmm. so you can there in the book it outlines the various and we call this amino acid utilization how much of the amino acids that come in the food are actually utilized by the body to make protein so soybeans and whey are 16 or 17 percent um meat fish and meat and fish are about 33 percent utilized eggs are about the best they're like 48 percent utilized Breast milk is about 49% utilized. So it's the best food. It's just hard to get it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So most of the plant proteins are very low. Uh, spirulina is zero to 6%. So the idea that you started with, which is, a, you know, tuna fish equals yogurt equals hemp protein peanut equals butter. fish yeah. equals peanut butter. It isn't true. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this thing in nutrition is a gram of protein has four calories, right? Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a stable data in nutrition. Yep. But if that gram of protein got incorporated into body tissue, it's no calories. Because mm -hmm. you're not burning that. It's part of your arm or part of your heart or part of your hair. Mm -hmm. It's only the part of the, pro, of the amino acids that you eat that aren't utilized that produce calories. So we have a formulation called Perfect Amino. It's Perfect Amino because it's the perfect exact blend of the eight essential amino acids. And if a person takes that in, 
Within 23 minutes, it's in their bloodstream. So it's pre-digested, it's, it's amino acids. 99% of those amino acids will be incorporated into body tissue, which is double, better than double the best regular protein, which is breast milk uh, or eggs. And so if you're a person, and so then what I found is that almost everybody that we tested who had chronic illness had very low levels of amino acids in their body, in their blood. And that if we gave them supplementation with essential amino acids, that's perfect amino, within a few months, their amino acid levels in their blood came up and they would then heal faster, get more energy, their hair would grow better, their nails would get thicker, and they would feel better because they actually had a nutritional deficiency that they didn't even know about, which is what was wrong with my hamstring. That's why it didn't heal. I had a nutritional deficiency of amino acids. I was a vegetarian at the time, and I thought I was doing really well. But what I found since is that virtually all vegetarians, all vegans, not 100%, but probably 99%, don't get enough essential amino acids to meet their body needs. Now, there are a few people around um, who have a gut that, that has bacteria in it that are probably more like a cow. So a cow can eat grass and build a 2,000 pound animal. Or a whale can, can, can eat you know, algae and build bodies that weigh thousands of pounds. But most of, and so these bacteria have the capability of manufacturing essential amino acids, but very few humans have the right profile. And so if they're vegan, vegetarian, they're, they're gonna almost always be low and they can supplement with perfect amino because it's vegan sourced. You know, so there's no animal products in there. It's kosher. You know, it's like pure. Uh, it even has an athletic, the athletic, uh, the, it's, it's legal. It's WADA legal. So athlete, professional athletes can take it and they won't. It, they, it's been certified as, as drug free and everything else free. Mm -hmm. And we have thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have taken it and can feel the difference and write in and say, you know, this has changed my life. It's really better. My chronic inflammation is better. My energy is better, you know, depending on, and the book basically is a whole bunch of different categories of patients that I saw who came to see me with their story of they came in with osteoporosis or they came in with depression or they came in with anxiety or sleep problems, or they couldn't build muscle or their thyroid hormone was low or whatever and that they could then using uh, amino acids, essential amino acids is perfect amino, and then probably some other supplementation because it's not the only thing that's wrong, but can make a huge difference. In people. Mm -hmm. So I want to rewind just a little bit and touch on, well, a lot of things here, but let's go back to the byproduct of the amino acids or the protein if it's not used. You said that was nitrogen? Yeah. So if you take this basic structure of the three sort of macro nutrients, so you have carbs, fats, proteins, okay? All of them have carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, okay? So fats and carbohydrates are basically made out of the same thing. They're just arranged differently. So one looks like a fat and one looks like a carb. Mm -hmm. Amino acids are also built out of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, but they have an extra piece on there, which is nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So amino in Greek is nitrogen. So it's an amino acid. It's an acid, which is carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and there's a nitrogen stuck on there, which makes it an amino acid. Mm -hmm. Now there's, there's, you know, there's 22 different amino acid configurations. So sometimes the tree looks like this, and sometimes it looks like this, and sometimes it looks like this, depending on the arrangement, but they've all got nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So so my thought on this, Dr. Minkoff, is you have a lot of bodybuilders out there and people that think that they need protein, 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 and they're eating pounds of chicken and fish and whey protein shakes and all these things. And then said bodybuilder goes out and gets their blood work done. And there are some markers on there that are higher than anticipated. And so can you tell me how the nitrogen is affecting those numbers and what number in particular that that affects? Yes. So let's say I just went through this with someone. This is South Florida. It's a, it's a strength coaching um, company. And they were having their athletes 
taking the equivalent of a couple hundred grams a day of protein. A lot of it was whey. And they had trouble with people because their stomachs just couldn't take it. They would get bloating and gas, and they just couldn't take it. And they were looking for a substitute. And I said, if you give them that much whey, only 16% of it is actually utilized by the body. So you have 84% of it is not utilized. Now, if the amino acid is sitting, now this is the spare parts in the car that are sitting around the lot. Our bodies don't have a storage depot for amino acids. Like there are storage depots for fat, okay? We all have fat. And there are storage depots for glycogen. So your muscles and your liver can store a certain amount of glycogen. Mm -hmm. There is no storage depot for amino acids. So either it gets used and it gets made into a protein or the carbon hydrogen oxygen chain with the nitrogen has to be separated because it's a waste product. And the body pulls off the nitrogen. Nitrogen is toxic. So it goes to the liver, it gets complexed with some other things and it gets turned into urea. That's what, this is why we pee. And that urea goes to the kidney and you urinate it out. So most of the nitrogen from the body that's excess gets urinated out. And you can measure nitrogen levels in urine. Before it gets to the urine, it goes into the blood. And there is a blood test called BUN, blood, urea, nitrogen. And people who are overeating protein, their blood, urea, nitrogen levels can go high. Or people who have bad kidneys, they go high because they can't get rid of the nitrogen that they're eating. And someone with kidney failure, they have to go on dialysis because they can't get rid of the nitrogen as well as salts and some other waste products. But nitrogen is the main culprit. So virtually all kidney patients who are on dialysis are on very low protein diets because they don't want them to get nitrogen because then they have to get dialyzed more and they can't get rid of it. They can eat the carbs and they can eat the fats. But when you put people on dialysis on low nitrogen diets and low protein diets, now their body starts to break down. They get their, their immune system goes down, they get infections, they get their skin breaks down, they bleed easy. And so we have a whole massive group of people who are chronic kidney patients where they can take the, the, the perfect amino and keep their blood levels of amino acids normal and their body doesn't break down, but it doesn't contribute to the nitrogen. So it's not a problem for them. Same with chronic liver patients, the same thing happens. So, so in a sense, Dr. Minkoff, are you saying that when people um, have a high bun, like say they go in and they get their blood work done and it's super high, is that maybe an indication of how effective the amounts of protein they're eating is actually being? Could that be an indication of that? Well, it's usually an indication that they're getting too much nitrogen for their body to handle. And I don't see it as a good thing. I think it's, it's a bad thing. Right. Because right. they get a nitrogen overload and that, and that nitrogen, it's not good for them. And they're, so if you're eating too much protein, and your BUN is high, and you're not dehydrated, you know, everything else is okay. Mm -hmm. you're, over, you're eating too much protein for what your body can use. And actually what you're doing is you're eating protein that your body can't utilize. See, the, mm -hmm. it only goes to nitrogen. See, if that amino acid comes in and it gets stuck in the middle of a, you know, a chain of skeletal muscle or hair or something else, it won't raise the BUN mm -hmm. because it's not free. The BUN is wasted nitrogen. Mm -hmm. The nitrogen that gets incorporated is what we want. The reason we're eating protein is because the nitrogen get, then gets utilized mm -hmm. and it can, it can be used then to heal or to build. That's what you're trying to do. Right. See, that's the problem with branched chain amino acids. It's three amino acids. You can't use them. They're going to all turn into sugar. They're going to turn into, they get turned into a carbohydrate with nitrogen waste. And there isn't any evidence that branched chain amino acids improve anabolic efficiency. All they do is they, instead of burning up your muscle when you need calories, your body will burn the branched chain amino acids so you may preserve some muscle, but you can't make muscle out of three amino acids, which mm -hmm. is what branched chain amino acids are. So branched chains are all essential. They're in mm -hmm. perfect amino, but you need the other five or you're not gonna really make protein. 
And I'm so happy you said that. You almost stole that thought right out of my little thought bubble that was right up above my head there. You must have I read saw. it or something <laughs> like that because I was like, okay, well, I have people that are like, I take amino acids. And I'm like, no, different, different thing. And then you have other people that in these whey protein complexes, they are like, no, we have added all of the essential amino acids. So now it's a complete protein. How do you feel about that? Well, it's sort of the same as if you threw, if you added another 500 tires to the, to the lot, and then you threw in some, um, some extra nuts and bolts that weren't utilized, the more you put in that aren't essential, the more waste you're going to get. So it's usually a hit and miss process when you see proteins and then on the side they said they have added amino acids usually the utilization of those is under 20 percent it's mm -hmm. just it's a lot of stuff that the body can't translate it it can't utilize it mm -hmm. so so yeah so you're really not helping yourself okay it's and calories that's... right but it's not but if what you want is protein to build and recover um it's you you get a lot of extra stuff with it that you don't need doesn't mean that they don't work people can gain muscle with whey protein i'm not anti whey protein i mm -hmm. just think if people understand how this works they can be more they can they can, it can do a lot of things for their body that the whey protein's not going to do right absolutely and then let's talk about just like you talked about the percentage that can be utilized but on people eating really good whole foods diets a lot of people would argue that oh i'm eating all this whole food, I don't need to have a supplement. What's your rebuttal to that? I think what, if they look at their blood profile of their amino acid in their blood profile, mm -hmm. you can tell immediately. Now, sometimes it turns up where they're anemic and it may not be iron. It may, I mean, the middle of the, of the red blood cell is hemoglobin. It's a protein. Mm -hmm. And so you need amino acids to build that. And we've seen people where they come in and they say anemia of unknown origin. You know, their B12 levels fine and their B6 levels fine and their iron levels fine, which are common things that cause anemia in people. Mm -hmm. Nobody's looking at their amino acids and you say, okay, let's do double dose amino acids for a few months and then remeasure your blood and the blood will go up because what they really needed was amino acids. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same with bone, you know, like you go to the doctor and the, and the, it's usually women, but some men. You know, you've got osteoporosis, like your bones are falling apart. And most people will think of vitamin D and they'll think of hormones as needed for building bone and calcium and phosphorus. But the structure of the bone is built on a protein st structure. And that protein structure is made out of amino acids. And you can throw all the calcium and vitamin D you want at it. But if the, if the structure isn't there so that the mineral can get laid down on top of it, you won't build bone. So we find that part of our solution to osteoporosis is you've got to get these pers this person's amino acid levels up really good. And then if you give them vitamin D and hormones and enough calcium and phosphorus and other stuff, boron, and, uh, and, you know, that you can then, they will build bone, you know, in the right exercise, you know, the right stimulus to the bone so that they have a, their body, you know, wants to build bone. You put them on a vibra plate and you have them lift weights and things like that. They will build mm -hmm. bone. Mm -hmm. You know, they can recover from it. That was going to be my next question when you were talking about all this is, is how you felt about people that are in a osteoporosis state or in a, a state like that, how you felt about that as treatment for that, you know, weightlifting wise. Well, I think, you know, I, I, I prescribe people if the best solution, you know, once the nutritional thing is handled, see, if they go to the doctor and their vitamin D levels 10, well, they definitely need vitamin D. But if their body calcium, if their blood calcium level is fine, they probably aren't calcium deficient and throwing calcium at them probably has a downside. It just ends up in their arteries. Um, and, you know, if, if the person's hormones are really low, you need estrogen and progesterone and testosterone to build bone. If the levels are really low, those can help. Um, but a lot of times it's amino acids and they need it. And then the other part of it is there needs to be a stimulus. So I find that squats and deadlifts 
do the best for bone. And if a person will do that two or three times a week under supervision, so they're doing it properly, they can really, they can build bone back. And within six months, you can see it. Mm -hmm. The other thing is with the, what, you know, the, when the first astronauts went into space, they were up, they were circling the, the uh, uh, orbiting around the earth. And when they came back down, within a month or two, they had severe osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. Now, these people are highly selected as not only brilliant guys, but very physically fit to withstand this sort of stuff. And when they found osteoporosis in these guys in 60 days, they were like, holy smokes, what's going on? Well, there's no gravity up there. And so the bones would lose the mineral. And so they invented these things called vibro plates. You probably use them or seen them mm -hmm. where you stand on there and the thing vibrates your body. And they put those in the space capsules and those guys every day get on that vibro plate for 10 or 12 minutes. And then they, when they came back down, they didn't have osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. So I find with people on Amazon for like 270 bucks, you can buy a pretty decent vibro plate. And I have people just go to Amazon and buy the thing and every day stand on it for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And you can do squats, you can do weights while you're on it, or you can just stand there and hold on to the handles. But it gives the body enough vibration stimulation that it causes bone to be laid down. I and love I that. They, yeah. Yeah. And so that kind of always brings me to this one thought. And this was before I was ever a personal trainer or into nutrition. I was watching some show. I don't know if it was National Geographic or what it was, but they were cave diving and they found some ancient skeleton in there of a female and they thought she was like 17 years old but they noted that they were able to see how hard she worked because of her bone density because it, mm. it was very apparent that she had obviously been lifting lots of heavy things and like and stuff like that because her bone density was her bones were super thick and they were they were they made a great note of that and I always for some reason that's filed in my brain because I was like wow this girl was I know more obviously now but this girl was lifting these heavy things and her bone responded to that um, another right. another example of that is I've been in dentistry for 13 years and people when they grind and clench their teeth a lot they grow tori and and buccal exotosis and all sorts of fun things like that which is all bone growth in response to constant pressure on that area so all of a sudden all these things started coming together in my brain as like okay you pray, place stress on this it's going to grow it's going to strengthen not only your muscle it's going to strengthen your bone as well exactly perfect so and it also that means that if you're starting, you ought to kind of go a bit gradual yeah. because you can you can injure it if you try to go too fast because there is a there's a remodeling process that occurs. Mm hmm. So while we're on this little subject here, I'd love to get some information from you as far as how you feel about blood flow restriction training or occlusion training. Do you, are you on that bandwagon off of it? Do, what are your thoughts? Uh, I'm on it. I do it. I like it. I do it two days a week. Um, and it's funny because I get, when I do it, I get stronger. I mean, it really it within a couple of weeks, I see change, you know, you're adding five more pounds. Like it's, 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 uh, it's very interesting. I, you know, and then I noticed I, I stopped doing it for a while. My house had been remodeled and my, my exercise room got sort of messed up and I, and I, I didn't do it for a while. And I actually lost some strength. And it was like, you know, I used to do, be able to do like five pounds more on my dumbbell, my dumbbell presses and I don't know. It's not there. And then I, I just started this week. I put the bands back on and I'm using it and it's like, Oh, you know, you can feel it. It's uh, it, I, I really like it. I think it's, I think it's great. Especially possibly for people that are intimidated by going into the weight room and lifting or, or maybe they're at a, a more aged state where they can't tolerate that kind of exercise. I know there's been a lot of studies out there backing up blood flow restriction in older people in elderly populations to prevent sarcopenia, which is yeah. loss of muscle. Right. And they don't have to do heavy weights. That's the other thing. You know, like I'm trying to, to do heavier weights, but 
you don't have to do heavy weights and you do more reps. Once you get that muscle hypoxic, you know, you, you stress it enough so that with the blood flow restriction, that muscle is needing oxygen. You can do it with 10 pounds. You don't have to do it with 35 or 40 pounds mm -hmm. and you will get a training effect. So older people who don't have big strength and who don't even want to do it, they can use their little dumbbells and do the thing. And if the blood flow restriction is there, they will get a response. That's what I told, like, I'm like, hey, grandma, you can put these on and grab a soup can and just, you know, move your arm up and down and you could get results from that. The, the hormone release even is an incredible thing for people. Yeah. Yeah. So, so no, I think it's brilliant work and I, 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 uh, I've been into it for a while and I, I really like it. Awesome. So tell us, I actually, uh, let me rewind here just a moment. So I will say this, I started using your guys's product and it's kind of a little coincidence. I started using your guys's product and I noticed almost immediately, probably within a week that my recovery was a lot better. And, uh, I do load it more than your recommended. Well, you have a recommended dose for people that aren't athletes, I think on there or something like right. that. And then right. a higher dose for people that are putting their body under strain. Um, so I was going for the higher dose and I noticed yeah. almost within a week or so that I started to recover a lot better. So then I, I was like, okay, I'm going to tell my friend about this, uh, because she could maybe utilize it or whatever. And, yeah. uh, I actually think maybe you guys released it on, um, uh, what is it? Uh, full script. Did you put it on full script? Yes, we did. Okay. That's why. So she does full script and I was like, Hey, and I'm pretty sure you can get it on full script. So you should check it out. And she was like, Oh, okay. Let me look, send me a picture of it or whatever. And I sent her a picture and she was like, Oh, I've been taking this forever. It improves my workout so much and all this stuff. And I was like, okay, good. It's not just a placebo effect. I know that this is actually something that's legit. So, uh, yeah. I, I do have to say that I have, I'm, I'm, a, I'm kind of a supplement snob. I don't take a lot of supplements. Um, I have a couple that I do take and I incorporated yours in and I was pleasantly surprised by the fact that it was really great. So you definitely hooked me on it. <laughs> Good. You know, the other thing is we just, we, we have a relatively new product, which is our electrolytes mm -hmm. and we've put in per scoop of electrolytes. So it's a mixture of sodium, potassium, rather high potassium for most electrolyte mixtures, um, zinc, magnesium, and a whole bunch of trace elements. But we put two grams of perfect amino per scoop. Mm -hmm. And this has been for athletes, the feedback from the athletes, especially if there's a lot of sweating or if they're doing aerobic exercise, this mm -hmm. product is incredible. And I, if, if you haven't tried it, uh, we should have you try it. And um, it's really, it, it is really good. Like, mm -hmm. like regular electrolytes are fine and you need it if you're sweating a lot. But when you put some amino acids in there, there is a difference. There is a, there is a body just as like stronger I feel it mentally too. Like when you're tired, you can hold your concentration. Um, it's also a great, it's a, it's, I just recommend it really. The feedback on it is terrific. That's awesome. I love that. I'll have to um, get myself some more of that stuff because I did have a little yeah. bit of it and I was using it and then I ran out. So I need to, I need to do that. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I, I am, I am happy to share with my listeners though. I have tried your product. I have had a good experience with your product. And so I definitely am on the train of your amino acid thoughts there. So yeah. Thank you. Um, but yeah. So um, before we run out of time here, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about you yourself, your training. I mean, your, your, you're a master's competitor, obviously, uh, and you're still out there rocking it. You just said you were training for races right now. So what does your training look like and how has it changed over the years? I'm busier now with sort of practice and business than I ever have been. So I probably have a 60 hour work week. Um, so I used to be able to, I used to like between 20 and 22 hours a week would be good for Ironman training. Uh, I can't do it now. I don't have enough time. So I usually get a long day Sunday. What, what I do right now is Saturday morning. I'm about five miles from the ocean uh, or from the Gulf, from where I am. So I will warm up and then I'll do a bike ride. It's a, it's a junk heavy bike. 
because at mm -hmm. the beach it'll get stolen. So it's an ugly bike. No one would take it. So I I, I get on that bike and I ride the five miles and there's a there's a bridge in between. That's you. I would call it a mountain, but I've been to Coeur d'Alene and I know what mountains are. But around <laughs> in Florida, a mountain is a bridge that goes over some water. So <laughs> it's probably three percent grade for maybe a quarter mile. So, but that's the best we've got. So anyway, I ride to the beach and once, once I'm warming up, I go as hard as I can. I then, uh, I'll, I'll swim between 2000 and 4,000 yards. It depends on where I am. So that's a, that's an open water swim. Mm -hmm. And then I'll run between eight and 15 miles and then I'll ride the bike back home easy. So that's my Saturday. Mm -hmm. And then Sunday, I'll do a 40 to 90 mile ride, depending on the, on the day, you know, depending on what I'm doing. Like now I'm starting to ramp up. So tomorrow, so this Sunday, I'll probably ride 70 or 75 miles. Um, during the week, I usually take um, Mondays off and uh, Tuesday and Thursday, I'll do a pool swim workout. Um, I was doing masters, but the masters is the pools are all sort of crazy. You can't get in locker rooms. And so I'm just doing it on my own. And, uh, Tuesday and Thursday, I'll do an indoor bike interval workout on a trainer. Um, I'll do Roby or I'll do one of the workouts. I have a, I have a Wahoo, uh, kicker and I'll, I'll do that. I'm jealous. And, uh, <laughs> huh? I'm wanting to get myself a Wahoo and I, I'm going to pull the trigger on it here pretty quick, but I'm jealous of that. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and then, um, Wednesday and Friday I'll do a, uh, interval runs. So, um, usually three to six miles, just depending mixture of sort of quarter miles, one miles, um, six to 10 repeats, depending. Um, so it's not a lot of hours, uh, probably 10, 12 hours a week. Um, but I feel pretty good and I'm not breaking down and I'm, you know, it's what I can do and it works. And so there's not a, you know, in my age group at Ironman now, there's maybe between 10 and 20 of us and we're all kind of, most of the guys have been doing it for a long time. So it's friendly, it's fun. And we're just trying to improve ourselves. You know, an Ironman is a race against yourself and against your own head. And can you, you know, can you still do it? Mm -hmm. um, after I finished my first, my first Ironman was Ironman Hawaii in 1982. And at the end of that race, I could not remember why I wanted to do it. And when I finished, I decided I was never going to do another one. And we, I was living in San Diego at the time and on the way back in the plane and the guy, my training partner went with me and he had the same feeling. And on the way back in the plane, there was like 40 guys that had done the race. And, um, the, uh, uh, so you start talking with everybody and we for so for six hours, we all commiserate, commiserated about the race and how tough it was. And by the time the plane landed, almost all of us decided we were going back next year because we weren't going to let this race beat us. So <laughs> that's sort of my philosophy in life. You just keep doing it until you get it. And if you went down, that just means you got to get up and you just got to do it again because the, you know, the, the guy who survives is the guy who wins and the guy who keeps making it fun is the guy who has a happy life. Mm -hmm. I love that. And, you know, I can relate with it on so many levels um, I'm training for my first endurance bicycle race here, and uh, it's a totally different thing than what I've ever done before. I mean, I've been bodybuilding for the last four or five years, and so uh, a totally different thing. I fell into it, and I had major hip surgery, and that's all they would let me do is ride a bicycle, and when I started riding, I was like, dang, I really like this, and uh, this, this climb, you know, how we are here where I live, this, this race has 6,700 feet of elevation gain throughout the race. And, yeah. uh, I'm telling you the hills are brutal. <laughs> and so yeah. I have been, um, 
training hills like crazy, training climbs like crazy. And there's a lot of times in the middle of the climb, I'm like, why am I doing this? Why do I want to do this? This is horrible. And then I get to the top and I see the view and I am like, I feel so accomplished. I just conquered that piece of crap hill right there. And it's just right. such a flood of of, wow, I pushed myself through a point where I was like, no, I'm not going to make it. I made it to the top. Here I am. It's an incredible view. And I never would have got there if I didn't push myself. And the reward is, right. is, isn't immense. It's wonderful. Right. Right. So, and it translates to all aspects of your life. You know, the easy things don't usually have much satisfaction and hard things that are overcome do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people run into challenges all the time whether it's business or relationships or physical things, but the guys who can just like, okay, next, you know, one foot in front of the other, I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to keep working it. You can get it. And uh, I think that, that people who, who, who can discipline themselves to do that can really make something out of themselves and have, uh, have a great life. I love that so much. So obviously you have a lot of life experiences and things. If there was one thing you could share that you've learned to my listeners, what would it be? I think you can always do something about anything. Like I don't think there's a point in a person's life where there isn't a future that they can dream and imagine and work toward. And that whatever failures you've had in the past are in the past. It's not you. It's an experience. And I heard this from somebody else uh, the other day, and I think it's really true. It isn't what life, you know, so you get an experience that you, you didn't really want. And if you take the attitude of it's not what life does to you, you have to look at it as what did life just do for you? Like there's a lesson, there is something to learn. There is something like if you take it as somebody looks at you wrong, it's a slight, okay? If they look at you wrong and you take it as a slight, now you just killed yourself for a minute or five minutes with negative emotions and thoughts and the rest of the stuff. But if you took it as what was that lesson? Well, that person is in pain or that person is suffering, or that person needs a friendly hand, or that person needs like, can I help you with anything? That is a different message that you take from the experiences that you get. Something was done for you. And if you can take it as that, you can change your whole life and you can affect a lot of other people in a great way. Because the easiest thing to do is just react and then do something stupid or do something self-destructive. So you like COVID, there's a gift in COVID. It's terrible, right? Mm -hmm. but there's a gift here. And what is the gift? What is the message? What is the lifestyle change that I had to make, which makes me better or more accomplished or gave me time to do something that I didn't have time for? And mm -hmm. when I look at it that way, you know, it's sort of a backwards gratitude, you know, where like, I got it and I'm happy for it, but what is the thing that I can learn for it or that changes me or that makes it better or that I got as a result of it? And that's always there. And I think if, if a person can cultivate that as a disciplined attitude, or at least, you know, the more I can do it in myself, um, the better things look. And, um, and, and you can be cause over your life and that's how you do it. I love you that where everybody, you know, everybody determines your mood, your goals, your attitude, your success. And that's just the most miserable thing you can do. I mean, you look at all the victims that are around, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm a victim. I'm a victim. They did it to me. They did it to me. They took it away from me. They did all this stuff. No, you were there. You decided to be there and you could look at it completely differently. And if you did, you would then have a bit more cause over your life than you did before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you look at anyone who's successful or happy, that's what they do. That's how they live, whether they know it or not. That's what they've done. They've been over to overcome. They've taken those barriers and they found ways around. Them. Boy, 
you could be an inspirational speaker on that one. I appreciate that so much. I try to tell people that same exact thing. They're like, how do you do it? I'm like, well, I do it. I, I'm the driver of my bus and I drive it to where I want to go. So I love that. And I'm really appreciative that you shared that with everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm so thankful you came on the podcast. If people want to find you or your products or your book, where's the best place for them to do that? Um, go to bodyhealth.com or lifeworkswellnesscenter.com. Well, Lifeworks Wellness Center is a clinic. Body Health is the product company. There's tons of, we have a YouTube channel, uh, Dr. Minkoffer at Body Health. So there's tons of videos. We're on social media, uh, Body Health Optimized. Um, and um, you can find us there. So come find us and we'd love to interact with you. I love that so much. Thank you so, so much for spending time with me. I heavily appreciate it. I loved it and your delight. And thank you for having me. Thank you.